Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Glen Eagles University. I thought that would sound really cool tonight. Thank you for joining us on a Thursday evening. And uh, we keep on continuing our, uh, our environmental lectures. We've learned how to recycle, right? We've learned about climate change. And I know that a few of you have talked about going you know, solar and solar energy and roofs and how that comes about and what actually is savings and how do you, and some of you are a little hesitant to learn about solar or you actually have a ton of questions. So I have brought the expert to you and he's in Washington, DC. I scoured the country looking for this gentleman and to find you the perfect person that could talk to you about renewable energy, um, again, the solar aspect and what we can do to save, you know, what we can do at home to, um, to reduce our what we, carbon footprint, we call it. So without uh, further ado, I'm gonna let uh, Mr. Brian Keene introduce himself because his resume and his experience is a mile long. And like I did say earlier, we hope to bring him back next month and the month after for a three-part series. And uh, he has books available. I have them at my desk. So if you do want a copy, that you, if you come on late, I will certainly get one to you. So everybody, welcome, Brian. Excellent. Hey, Tammy, thank you so much. <clears throat> and everybody, thank you for having me. Um, so as Tammy says, my name uh, is Brian Keene. And uh, really what I wanna talk about tonight is the work that we've been doing at my nonprofit called Smart Power. Um, <clears throat> and really that in, in, entails helping people make, as we say, smart energy choices. So about 20 years ago, I started Smart Power, which is a nonprofit organization that really helps people figure out <clears throat> how to become, as we say, energy smart, how to buy renewable energy, how to become energy efficient. And so, you know, 20 years ago, um, back in 2002, uh, people really didn't talk a lot about solar power. They didn't talk about energy efficiency. Uh, but we started a nonprofit organization that actually helped people figure out why they would want to do this. And our charge was really to try to sell this stuff like it's Coca-Cola, sell it like it's McDonald's. Uh, <clears throat> and what I want to do tonight is kind of walk you through our, real, our, our story really for the past 20 years. So I want to walk you through some of our consumer market research. I want to walk you through really the story of quite frankly, the United States, what we've been doing in the US uh, as American consumers for the past 20 years. How did we get to this point today where people are talking about you know, reducing our carbon footprint? Because quite frankly, we weren't talking about that 20 years ago. So let me just kind of walk you through some of these slides. Um, I do have a lot of slides and we can jump through a bunch of them fast. Let's make this a conversation um, and stop me if, you, if I'm boring you. Uh, but just jump on in and kind of ask any questions. And uh, let's, uh, let's have fun with this. So tell me, Tammy, can you, uh, can people see my screen at this point or am I? Not yet, not yet. Not yet. And remember everybody, if you need to unmute yourself, the quick way to do it if you're on a computer is just hit the space bar, okay? And talk like a walkie talkie, Thanks. all right? So Brian, no, we have not, uh, there you go. There you go. And you just wanna. And then I want to go to my slideshow. Great. So as I said, uh, I run a nonprofit called Smart Power, <clears throat> and we started in 2002. Our niche is really as a, as a marketing organization. Uh, our charge is to get the American people to buy renewable energy, solar power, wind power, energy efficiency products, to sell it the way Coca-Cola sells Coca-Cola the way McDonald's sells hamburgers. Quite frankly, you know, for the past 40 years, they've been selling solar power because it's good for the environment. And it is good for the environment. But that's not why people buy this stuff. People buy this stuff for their own values, for their own reasons. And we should be talking and selling it to them in the words and the language that they want to hear, not really for the words and language I want to give it to them. And that's really just good marketing. So that's really kind of what we do. Our, we have an exclusive focus as a marketing firm 
on clean energy, energy efficiency, and getting that word out to the American consumer. So, you know, back in 2002, even back in 2002, 84% of the American people said that they wanted to buy clean energy. And yet, less than 3% of the American people actually did. So, you know, why were they lying to us? Why is it that 84% of the American people said they wanted to buy solar power and, and nobody did? So to us, that right. really, yes. Do we have a question already? But to, so to us, it's kind of like, what is going on where they're trying to actually, they're saying they want to buy it, but then they actually won't. Uh, what is happening in this marketplace? So we actually undertook a tremendous amount of consumer market research back at, starting back in 2002 and actually continuing today to find out what is actually happening in the mind of the American consumer. We had to create a message. We had to understand the barriers that they were facing when they actually say, yeah, I want to buy solar power, but then they don't. What did, what's actually happening in the mindset? If clean energy was actually going to survive in the marketplace, we needed to actually understand the emotional barriers that people were having. Like they, they were inherently were saying they wanted to do it, but then they actually weren't going to do it. Um, and so part of that, and the number one reason that kind of we had to deal with first was actually some of the language and some of the words. And you even see that it's still today. People will talk about renewable energy. They'll talk about green energy. They'll talk about alternative energy. It's very confusing to the American consumer when you're talking about all these different words that, you know, quite frankly, mean the same thing. So we were trying to figure out, you know, what words should we be using? So basically just by polling, we were trying to figure that out. And you actually can see, you know, the number one word and phrase that people responded to was natural energy. If, people, if we actually call this natural energy, most Americans said, oh, that, that actually says to me, that's energy produced by natural resources. Um, now, and then, it, then they said it was clean energy, alternative energy, renewable energy, green energy, green power, and it went down the, the, the slope like that. Now, interesting, underneath kind of some of that research, when we talked about natural energy, there was confusion among Americans because uh, natural gas uh, is a very heavily branded term. You, a lot of everybody is aware of natural gas. Um, and so that's why we actually wound up not talking a lot about natural energy, but we spoke, we speak more of clean energy um, than we do about natural energy. Uh, Ironically, by the way, you know, you'll, you'll see the ads for natural gas and you, we all, a lot of people have natural gas in their own home. Um, just for the record, all gas is natural, but yet it's a natural, it's a branded term. So, so it's kind of funny that they branded gas as a term, but all gas is natural. Um, but we use, we speak a lot about clean energy. Um, when people speak of alternative energy, while that polls kind of, as you can see, it pulled high, but it actually has a negative connotation to the American consumer. Um, and it actually, you can see that because when something is alternative, it's not mainstream. It actually doesn't fit in with your daily life because quite frankly, it's alternative. And so that we kind of shied away from that. Then you had a renewable and then green and green power and, and so forth. Um, so we actually skewed more towards clean energy, um, but the, as we kind of went away from kind of, we did the polling and we kind of saw some of these, these words, what we were really trying to find out and what we continue to try to figure out is what do people think about traditional energy? And, you know, when you come from the, the environmental side of this equation, there's always this pull, this kind of yin and yang of, oh, coal and oil are bad and renewable energy is good. And you'll see that kind of play out constantly. And you see it playing out constantly in Washington. And we were trying to figure out, do the American people really think that? And so we then, when we continue to do all these focus groups around the country, and a focus group is really where you get a group of people into a room and they really don't even know why they're there, but you actually give them a series of exercises and thought kind of exercises to work, work, work through. 
and you actually find out what they really think. And one of the ways to figure out how somebody really thinks about something is to take it away from them. So we wanted to think to figure out how do the American people really think about fossil fuels. In the environmental side, there's an assumption that, oh, people hate fossil fuels because it's polluting and it's bad. And so let's, and, and so they must love solar and wind and all that. But it, let's find out what they really think. So we got to, we would cross the country, we do all these focus groups and you put them in a room and you say, okay, if you want to find out how somebody thinks about something, take it away from them. And so we got them into a room and said, okay, here's the exercise. Fossil fuels have died, write the obituary. So coal and oil have died, write the obituary. And the obituaries have been fascinating to read <clears throat> and fascinating because there's a real mixed emotions here. You read, you know, fossil fuels died after a long, slow illness called greed. Fossils have left the, left the family of the Middle Eastern nations and former President George W. Bush and his cabinet members. So uh, currently the world is adjusting from heating by oil and illuminating by electricity to solar and windmill sources. There are several kinks to be worked out and roadblocks to conquer. Will we ever be warm again? Miss you fossil fuels. And what's fast, there's so many fascinating pieces in this. Um, and we'll hit upon a, a couple of them. But uh, what we're seeing here is that the person who wrote this um, clearly has some type of political bent. Um, they're talking about uh, greed in that first line, the slow, Ill, uh, long, slow illness called greed. Um, and former President George W. Bush and his cabinet members, so they're kind of blaming people. And, and yet then they say we're currently, the world is adjusting from heating by oil and illuminating by electricity to solar and windmill sources. And they say there are several kinks to be worked out and roadblocks to conquer. And then the kicker of the whole thing, they say, will we ever be warm again? Miss you fossil fuels. So they've traveled quite a journey here because they've basically said, you know, a lot of the greed, a lot of, you know, uh, clearly they're not kind of fans, if you will, what one would assume a fan. And yet they're saying, will we ever be warm again? Pretty interesting. Similarly, it's with great sadness and re regret that we announce the demise of fossil fuels. After hundreds of years of supplying the population of earth, the resource has been depleted. It will be remembered for the warmth, comfort, and pleasure it provided to living things. There'll be a great void that needs to be filled perhaps through wind and solar and solar power. It will be sorely missed by all beings that depended on it to warm them, supply their transportation, power their equipment, and supply all the resources necessary for a safe and comfortable life. What this is saying is like, wow, the, the American people are really seeing in, that fossil fuels uh, power everything that we see in a comfortable life. Uh, and it's really stunning that, you know, yeah, quite frankly, we should actually acknowledge that everything that we see is, you know, giving us warmth and transportation and powering our comfortable life has been because of fossil fuels. So, you know, kind of this concept of like, oh, should renewable energy go after fossil fuels? It's probably not gonna win in the minds and hearts of American consumers. Because if you could get your product to say, it will be sorely missed by all product, by all beings that depended on it to warm them, supply their transportation, power their equipment and support all the resources necessary for a safe and comfortable life, that's a winning product. And that's really kind of how they're seeing uh, fossil fuels have, have gotten them, their families and us to this point. It's pretty, pretty striking. And again, fossil fuels would be remembered as the fuel of choice for the 20th and 21st centuries. Many of the biggest friends will recall its enormous contribution to the industrial revolution and the entire transportation industry. The estate will be divided by, this, by several heirs, uh, the nuclear power industry, the solar power contingent, and some of the more eccentric relatives, wind and geothermal power. Consumers, industries, and OPEC mourn its passing. Services will begin at sunrise and end at sunset. 
but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and so again, kind of, you know, and we're seeing eccentric relatives, like, you know, there is this sense that, you know, renewables, solar, wind, geothermal, they're not ready for prime time, that this is kind of an uphill battle that renewables are at, um, that fossil fuels, everything that's powered our lives has worked. And the sense that renewable energy is not there yet, uh, we're really up against it. So what we were really trying to figure out is, you know, really what we're seeing that people are saying you know you're not you're not able to beat these guys these guys power everything in our lives and they make us comfortable and so you got a long road to hoe still um and in the same vein then we said okay now that you've written this obituary now that you've told us that you know what it's like without them now draw us a picture of what the world would look like without fossil fuels. Um, and don't give us words, but give us pictures. And the only words you can actually give us is name this world with no fossil fuels, draw us a picture without fossil fuels, and then date this world. And so some of the pictures we were getting, this is called Solaria. And you can see, and, and the date on the bottom is 2033. So we're still, you know, more than 10 years away. But in this picture, uh, they drew a house, and on the house, there are so those are solar panels on the roof, and that's a wind turbine next to it. And then there's a hydrogen tank next to the house. There's a water, that's some type of water uh, thing next to it. And there's a water uh, thing here over as well. There's a bike there. And basically what this picture is saying is that if there's no fossil fuel, um, you're going to have a house with uh, a power system, solar panels, and another power system, wind turbine, and another power system, a water uh, system, and another power system, a hydrogen system, and another power system, another water system, and you're still going to be taking your bike to work. Um, and it's kind of striking that it's a power, it's a system against a system, and another system, and another system. And it's a backup and a backup and a backup and a backup. And you're still biking to work. Um, and yet it's very clean looking, it's very sweet, it's nice, it's a nice house. Um, but it's very kind of, it's just fascinating. This, this picture uh, is actually written, uh, drawn by a woman named Soledad um, and she named hers Paradise. Um, but she actually dated it as the year 1700, interestingly enough. So her picture, as you can see, it's beautiful, it's bucolic, and they are, um, you know, carrying their own water to the fire. Um, and and I, I was there when she drew this, like, and she said, "Oh no, it's great," but I, she said, "It's paradise," but I do not want to live there. And and as like, the, they're like, "Well, why why wouldn't you want to live there? It's paradise." And she said, "Well, because I wouldn't be able to call my daughter, because." Um, and she only has a cell phone and she'd never be able to charge her cell phone. And, you know, I'd never be able to talk to my daughter. So why would, why would I want to live there? Um, and so it is kind of this sense if we don't have fossil fuels, we're living back in time. Like this is kind of a backwards motion that we have to go. And so this is kind of the world that we're in where without fossil fuels, if we're living with renewable energy, people feel that, wow, we actually have a real, it's a real struggle. These are real barriers people are seeing. It means huge trade-offs. It's very inconvenient if we're using renewable energy. Um, they recognize, and they almost to a person, they recognize the problems and challenges of pollution. Fossil fuels, they, so they would say, are a necessary evil, um, but it but renewables, they believed, couldn't, could not be relied on to power their world. Um, they're far less critical of fossil fuels than one would have imagined. It keeps them warm. It keeps the lights on. It actually powers their world. It powers their work. It powers their homes. Um, and so <clears throat> at the end of kind of all this research and that we constantly keep doing, and this is really still true for almost over these past 20 years, there are four major barriers that American consumers face when they think of 
renewable energy. And they break down into really four categories. Number one is reliability. That they're not really sure that renewable energy works. And when they say that, what they mean is, can it really power my world? Can it power the city? Can it power, can it power New York City? Can it power Las Vegas? Can it power my office? Can it power my home? Like, does it actually really work? You know, like they can see it working on a, on a street sign when they're driving past at noon, but like, does it actually really work? And then the number two barrier is availability. And they don't know where to buy it. Because quite frankly, you don't just walk into CVS and buy solar. And it really is hard to buy solar. And I'm in the business, but it's hard to buy it. People don't know where to buy solar. Uh, and then the third issue is one of cost. Um, and truthfully, it's, more, it's just an expensive type of energy especially when your home already comes with energy, your office already has energy, then it's like, well, of the 10 things I need to do in my home, uh, energy is not one, it already has energy. Why do I need to buy another type of energy? Uh, so there's that. And then actually the cost issue breaks down in, in another way, which is one of uh, an opportunity cost. So, and it really is, it's if I buy solar, do I then need to buy into a lifestyle? Do I actually need to buy organic? Do I need to buy hemp? Do I need to kind of buy this entire lifestyle just because I bought solar? And it's like, no, you don't. And by the way, the cost is it's very affordable. And by the way, there's a real value to buying it of any type of different value systems that you buy into. So there are whole reasons why we wanna break down these barriers, but, and I'll get to that, but it's kind of fascinating that the, these are the barriers American consumers face. And then the fourth is just one of inertia. And that's any new product coming on the market faces this issue of inertia, which is, you know, quite frankly, it's easier to, to do nothing. Um, and so we have to kind of create a momentum to get people to buy new products. So keep those barriers in mind as we kind of walk through this. Um, and really what we then understand in order to break down these four barriers, we know that American people need to see that clean energy actually works, that it can power their life and that it actually is a better value. They need to actually see it working before they'll be convinced to buy it. And that a marketing campaign on clean energy that actually shows how it works that real people that they know and that they trust using it will actually help them break through some of these barriers. And so that's really kind of where we then kind of took our efforts and kind of brought all of these kind of campaign, uh, brought these efforts to break down these barriers to try to do. Um, and so really the first effort was really to try to take this into a television and a radio and a newspaper campaign to show people that clean energy is real and it's here and it's working, let's make more. So we worked with a coalition of states to, to create radio and television and newspaper ads to actually show that it could work. Um, and let me just show you kind of a real quick, I'll show you some of these, a uh, couple of these quick ads just so you can see and, and it, they're interesting to see because um, quite frankly because they actually didn't work <laughs> um, can you see that screen now yes we can okay great let me see if America already produces enough clean energy to power every professional stadium in the country. Clean energy. It's real. It's here. It's working. Let's make more. So we were basically kind of showing that, you know, clean energy actually really does work and it's powering all of the issues, all of the... America already produces enough clean energy to power every hospital in the country. Clean energy. It's real. It's here. It's working. Let's make more. So you can see that it's, you know, it's powering all, every hospital here again. 
America already produces enough clean energy to power every factory in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. Clean energy. It's real. It's here. It's working. Let's make more. I'm going to just show you this last one, too. The, um... America already produces enough clean energy to power every home in 11 states. Clean energy. It's real. It's here. It's working. Let's make more. And the intent of, of these um, ads is really just to start showing people that, you know, actually it really does work and it's working now. Uh, and that since it is working, it's powering our lives as we know it. It does work. It's real. It's here. It's working. The interesting thing is that it wasn't conveying to the, to the consumers that they actually could be a part of it, that they could buy it, where to buy it. It wasn't knocking down those other barriers that we had talked about. Um, and so that was really kind of uh, really intriguing because what they were, sorry, let me get you back to my screen. Um, what they were then seeing was, um, that, yeah, okay, so it powers all those states, but what can I do about that? It wasn't giving them a call to action. And so then what we realized was like, oh, we then need to actually go into the communities and help people actually be part of the solution. And so then we actually wound up creating these on the ground outreach campaigns that actually allowed people to become part of that solution. So we quickly created kind of campaigns where people in their own communities could then be part of that. And early on, uh, it was actually even harder to buy, uh, put rooftop solar on. And so you, some of you may remember uh, really back in like 20, 2008, uh, there was various type of what they called green tag campaigns. And I write about that in my book a lot, but these green tag campaigns were where homeowners could buy uh, green tags to offset their energy use. Those campaigns we did a lot of, they, they actually became quite successful. Um, and we did a lot of that in Connecticut, uh, 169 towns in Connecticut. Um, and today over 120 towns are, are buying 20% green tags. Um, and I mentioned that simply because key to that was what we learned is that it's about community outreach. It's about online communications and about giving these communities and these people who live in these communities rewards and incentives, explaining that, you know, hey, it's not simply about um, buying solar, but actually giving credit also for doing the right thing, for being part of the solution. So we kind of did, we did Connecticut, we did Pennsylvania, and then actually just started to explode. And then you started to see across the country, all these different states and all these different communities were actually engaging in all different types of renewable energy campaigns. And these are just a variety of different campaigns that we were running on renewable energy, energy efficiency campaigns. And that brings us really to the energy efficiency piece that I think is really exciting and really fascinating. About 2010, 2012, the US Department of Energy asked us to create an energy efficiency campaign where people in their homes and at work and actually more specifically than college kids could actually start saving energy. Um, and it fascinating that the college dorm room uses more energy than the, the specific dorm room uses more energy than the White House did during all of World War II. So they were saying, how can we actually get college kids to actually start saving energy? And you know, we said, well, we could create a campaign that actually engages them online um, and shows them how to start saving energy. Shows them that in fact, you know, even though we have better homes today, these homes are using more energy. They're just leaking energy. And there are simple, quick, easy things we each can do, whether you're nine years old or 90 years old, to start saving energy. So we started with this concept of what's called phantom load or some call it vampire power. And that is the energy that every single one of our homes are using and we don't even know it. And it's really kind of the products, the gadgets that are in our home 
that are just using energy and we're not even aware of it. So specifically, I'm talking about, you know, the flat screen TVs. So your flat screen TV, when you click it off with your, with your TV clicker, with your remote control, it's actually still on and it's still drawing power. And it's actually still drawing power to the tune of about $100 a year when you think it's off. So you think about this, the average American home has more flat screen TVs than children. And that's a tremendous amount of not just money, but power that we are using. We don't even know we're using it. Your cell phone charger, when you are charging, you put your cell phone charger, you're charging it into the wall, and then you unplug your cell phone and you run out to the store, you run off to work, but you leave the charger in the, in the wall socket, it's still pulling power from the wall. And actually, per gadget, it's still about $10 a year per gadget of, of wasted energy, phantom load. And $10 a year, it's like, oh, well, what's $10 a year? Except that pretty soon, the average American is actually going to be plugging in about 15 different gadgets. So then you're talking real money. You're actually talking real energy. Today in the United States, there are 16 coal-fired power plants that are powered today just to produce the phantom load in this country. So if we want to reduce coal-fired power plants, let's just start with reducing our phantom load. Let's just start turning off and unplugging these gadgets that are using energy that we don't even know we're wasting. So we're not talking about you know, living in a cold, dark house. We're not talking about turning off the air conditioning in the middle of the summer or turning off the heat in the middle of the winter. We're just simply saying, let's just be, use common sense about the gadgets that are wasting energy, they shouldn't be wasting energy. And so kind of it's uh, simply just doing an assessment, you know, of your own kitchen, go into the American kitchen in the middle of the night and the average American kitchen has four clocks. And none of them are telling the right time, by the way, but they have four clocks. And, uh, you know, you'll see your microwave, by the way, your microwave oven has a clock. It's usually just blinking, but the microwave oven has a clock. The most energy that your microwave oven uses is to power the clock, not actually to cook the food, because that clock is on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So yeah, there's actually a fix to that, which is just unplug the microwave and then just plug it in when you use the microwave. And so it's like these simple, quick, easy fixes. The fix to the TV is actually just put it on power strip. And when you're not using the TV, click off the, the power strip. There are simple, quick, easy fixes. But what we know is that when people understand how energy is used, they'll want to fix it and actually then do something else. So with America, and this is really what we call uh, behavior change, that actually getting people to change their behavior over the long term has huge play. And you know, American corporations know this forever. I mean, McDonald's figured out that if you wanna sell hamburgers, sell it to a 10 year old, sell it to a five year old. And it's called, you know, they call that the shin kicker strategy. Get Ronald McDonald to get a five year old to kick his parents in the shin and say, I wanna to go to McDonald's. And then you're not just selling one hamburger, you're gonna sell hamburgers to the entire family that day and they're gonna eat french fries and they're gonna drink Coca-Cola. Um, and it's everything, you know, it's, we've all changed our behavior on how we shop because of amazon.com. We've changed our behavior on, on forest fires because only you can prevent forest fires. It's really unbelievable. And we can do that on how we use energy um, just by actually understanding how it works. And we believe that when we do that, we can then go, as we say, on the food chain of sustainability. And that really moves us from doing the very small, easy, quick, simple things all the way up to the big things. You know, a 10 year old today that turns off a light switch uh, will then actually be more inclined to actually turn off the TV. And then that 10 year old very quickly, by the way, will have a license in eight years to drive. And they actually will be more inclined to wanna buy an electric car, drive an electric car. They'll be more inclined to actually do the big things. And that's just a blink of an eye before they're driving an electric car. 
So it really does matter. Um, and really the way we look at it now is that to actually get this type of change to happen is not TV ads, it's not newspaper ads, not those ads I just showed you. It actually happens with real on the ground outreach, boots on the ground, it works with new and social media. And then we drive them with real kind of incentives to say like, hey, it's not simply just kind of doing good. It's actually really kind of an out of boy and kind of we incentivize them in other ways too. And that changes long-term behavior. So and that created our program, America's Greenest Campus. We got 20,000 participants in over 470 colleges. They actually change, uh, save 19 million pounds of, of uh, carbon. Uh, reduced 19 million pounds of carbon, 4.25 million dollars uh, in energy costs, um, and it was an unbelievable campaign that they actually saved energy, they saved money in all these different colleges by actually doing quick, simple, easy things. And we gave prizes to two colleges, American, um, uh, the University of Maryland and Rio Salado College in Phoenix, um, and it really was pretty, pretty amazing. The um, you could actually, and there's different videos you could go look at online to, um, to, to go see. I won't, I won't show you these videos now, but it was pretty, pretty cool to see. Um, and what we had was all these different colleges competing against each other in this big leaderboard. So they were actually, you know, um, I think it was the New York Times basically said, you know, it was, it was college sports for energy. They were all competing against each other to see who could save the Americans most, the, most, the most energy. Um, and then ultimately, as we talk about energy, we create kind of a comic book approach to this whole thing too. And I'm gonna run through these quickly. Um, but we created comic books, we went from college and then we went down into um, to, to working with children as well. And then that actually brings us to solar. And with solar energy, and uh, Tim, I know I'm going long, but I'm going to wrap up quickly. You're uh, fine. I okay. think, yeah, we're fine. Right, everybody? We're, keep it up. It's great. And don't hesitate to stop me for questions, too. But here's what we then ultimately realized with solar, and which is that, as I said earlier, solar is really hard to buy. It's really confusing. Um, and that we know one of the biggest problems is that there's no brand name in solar. There's no Coke, there's no Pepsi. And so what happens is that without a trusted brand name, the trusted brand becomes actually your, your trusted friend. And so as we kind of get into now the 2020s, we realize that with marketing, marketing today is a totally different game in that, you know, we are being constantly bombarded with marketing. Uh, you know, you, you're, you walk down the street and you're constantly bombarded with marketing. You open your phone, it's all marketing. To the point where it, we are missing messages constantly. The things that break through are when people that you know and you trust, people within your own social circles, when they tell you something, it actually resonates. And the point that the proof is somebody that you and, you and you know and you trust when they say, hey, I saw a great movie on Netflix last night and you should watch it. You are more likely to watch it. Uh, it's, and even if you'd seen an ad for that movie, if somebody you know suggested it, you're more likely to watch it. Same with a restaurant. You know, I went to a great restaurant last night. You got to go to that restaurant. People will do it. And that is what's happening with solar. In fact, if your next door neighbor has solar, you are 64% more likely to get solar. If you live within a mile and a half of somebody who has solar, you are 60% more likely to get solar. It's unbelievable. The best billboard for solar turns out to be solar. So like, so it's like, wow, that's the best advertisement. And when you live a mile and a half from somebody, you may not know them. Chances are you don't know them, but they are in the neighborhood. They're in the community. They're actually in your social circle. And so you actually have this sense of like, oh, people in my neighborhood have solar. 
it must be okay. It gives it that sense of trust. So our solarized campaigns actually turbocharge that relationship. We bring people together. We make it buying solar simple and we bring people together to show how it works. It is an on the ground and online outreach campaign that brings people together with friends and neighbors to actually learn about solar and then actually buy solar together. It brings the cost down and it brings the value and the trust up so that they can then together say, hey, if you're gonna buy solar, I'll buy solar. Or since you did buy solar, I'm gonna actually take your word for it that it actually works and I'm gonna do it. We actually started first in four communities in Connecticut with, solar, with a Solarize campaign. And now over 150 communities in Connecticut have done it. Um, and we, we actually have now solarized literally all the way from Connecticut to California. Um, it's an unbelievable process where really it's low tech, but actually connecting friends to friends, neighbors to neighbors and peers to peers um, and giving people the information they need, either word of mouth or online and both so they can actually connect. It makes it simple. What we also know is that, you know, there are a lot of solar installers out there. Uh, in Florida, by the way, particularly, there are a lot of solar installers. And that's great, but it also allow, it creates a lot of confusion. Um, and so what'll happen if you, you know, if you get 10 solar installers to call you, you will get 10 different prices for solar. Um, and it's kind of like, like getting 10 different prices for the same car. You're like, what is going on? I got the same roof. Why am I getting 10 different prices? So with Solarize, we actually do an RFP before the campaign, a request for proposals. It's where we then will pick one solar installer, usually just from the community, to be the official solar installer for the campaign, a 16 to 20 week campaign, um, so that they then will give just one price and they will be of the community. And so that there isn't that confusion. There's no kind of sticker shock. There's no confusion of getting 10 different prices for that one roof. Um, and more than likely it's like, oh, well, they're the solar install that has done, you know, 70% of the roofs in that community. Um, and people will understand and actually know where they are from. They'll know kind of, oh yeah, they're local and I can actually find them if there's a problem. Um, and then they come, there's no obligation to buy this. You kind of actually start walking through this whole process. Our job, we, we say is kind of, we hold the customer by the hand at, throughout this entire process, whether they buy or not, simply because it can be so confusing. As a nonprofit, our interest is actually making sure that people are getting the best deal and actually seeing if it's right for them. <clears throat> um, and then working within the community so that they can see like, oh, other people are doing this. This isn't a crazy thing. Uh, and it really kind of starts to work. We then buy, you know, work with the local leadership, the mayors, the city councilors, so that they can see this is actually, it has the imperature of, this, of the local community. And then they read about it in the local newspapers and that gives it some credibility and people understand like, oh, okay. So if I ever wanted to buy solar, now is the time to do it. And so I'm gonna do it now local activists, local communities. We, you know, with solarized campaigns, wherever people live, work, play, and pray, that's where we'll be. That's where the activists are. And people will actually see and be able to ask questions and learn about solar on the ground and online. And on the online component is really simple, really easy. They can actually put your, you know, address in, find out if your home is good for solar and actually create and see, you know, oh, my home is good for solar and actually sign up right then and there. It's also, by the way, completely contactless so that in the era of COVID, we can actually con uh, convene people um, contactless so that people can actually organize and run campaigns um, without having to um, you know, actually be in person. So kind of like we're doing now, but it's really kind of fascinating how people can volunteer together and be together separately, which is pretty cool. Um, ultimately, you know, the whole campaign itself is a community-based campaign where we bring together the utilities, the installers, the customers, the local community to actually make that community a leader in solar. And that community could be a city or a town. It could be a college or university. It could be a place of business. 
it could be a book club, it could be a church, um, anybody or anything that is looking to be a leader in sustainability. Uh, and all of the kind of, it's all based on the work that we as Smart Power have done, really not only over the past 20 years, but specifically on Solarize over the past 10 years, um, which has been done with uh, the New York University Stern School of Business and Yale University's uh, uh, School of Environment to really pinpoint and figure out exactly how this really works. So that's kind of, and, and all these reports, by the way, um, are available if you want to kind of, I could send you this link too, but all of the reports are available to figure out and see how it works um, in the research on it, which is really kind of fascinating. Hey, Brian? In. Yes. Um, Mr. Zimmerman, you are actually from Connecticut. Um, Milford, Connecticut. Oh, um, are you familiar with some of um, the communities in Connecticut and the solar rise? Do you hear Someone? me? Yeah, I can't, but I just heard you just now. Oh, okay. Yeah, I had to unmute. I didn't see, I have never seen solar rise Connecticut uh, campaign. But I have seen um, events where people are trying to promote it. Fantastic. So it's, and we've done Solarize Milford specifically. Um, and actually I could even send you, uh, Solarize Milford has been unbelievably successful. Oh, we, great. Oh, yeah. And it's I mean, really- We've certainly seen enough solar panels in our area, literally some next door to us. But you know, you can't do this in a, in a condo. That's, that's one of the problems with this. You can't go with that. Or can you? Or can you if the associations allow it? That's, that was gonna be a question I was gonna ask you. So it's fascinating. So what we see in, so there's condo associations, homeowners associations, um, right. and then there's, and there's different ways to kind of, you know, as we say, go solar. So the, by and large, and you know, the, the mind of the American consumer is a detached home, goes solar, and that's kind of it. But um, quite frankly, we could and can, um, you know, create a what that one would call a, a either a community solar. So, in a condo association, we can create a, uh, a solar array that everyone in the condo association is quite frankly owns and it powers in part everybody's home. Um, and it really is kind of cool. And increasingly, specifically in Arizona, actually, they're doing a lot of that. And it's really great because um, now we're getting a lot of uh, solar batteries that are coming online. And that becomes really relevant because uh, with solar batteries, you know, the, the it's being charged all day when, you know, you're, people are not using the solar all day, it's charged. So you can use the, the battery at night or even better when the power goes out. So there's a storm, the power goes out and that battery is just simply you know, able to power all the um, you know, refrigerators or, or key kind of uh, equipment throughout the whole, those homes. So there's ways to kind of do it and work with a condo association to kind of make that happen. And it's, it's, those are kind of fun conversations to have. 10 years ago, condo associations were like, no way, no how, there's no discussion. But increasingly we're seeing, they're kind of saying, well, is there, an, is there a way we could do something? You know, it's hard to put it on, you know, all these different roofs and there's no roofs to put it on, but could we create some situation where we could do it? And we'd love to have those conversations. The clubhouse could uh, uh, put it on, uh their roof and uh, lower or maybe lower the electric charge. The problem is, is that the electric charge in Florida uh, is so low yeah. that uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm in Massachusetts and it's uh, very high. So it may be better in Massachusetts. Yeah, that's, you know, it's, and that's, that is part of the challenge in Florida that it's so low. But that's what I think is so interesting is that it, the electricity rates are so low, but we also have the storm issue in Florida. So you, we do knock out power for so long. That's why it's, what I think is interesting we're seeing in Florida, there's so many more conversations now about batteries because 
when the power goes out, as opposed to having you know diesel generators, let's have a solar battery. Yeah. Especially, you know, we're seeing it as um as kind of um you know quite frankly, you have uh, life saving devices that need to stay on um, in homes, not in hospitals, but just in homes. Uh, and so if you have a solar panel that is charging a battery and then a hurricane comes in, knocks out power for three days, but if you have a solar charged battery that can stay on for three days and that individual is not going to a hospital, that individual is not in worse shape because that battery has kept that, that life-saving device on. And it is like, oh, that's a game changer. Like, it's really pretty cool. Um, it may not need to be powering the home during regular time, but it actually could save lives, you know, when the power was out. And we're just seeing more and more storms happen. So th it, it's kind of what we're, we're looking at is kind of what they would say resiliency issues. Which is kind Do of you, uh, I mean, support the, uh, Leasing or purchasing on them? So good question. I, um, I'm all about purchasing now. I used to be about leasing um, and leasing helped really spur on kind of this concept of people being able to buy, uh, to put no money down to get solar on their roof. And, uh, and now, by the way, uh, we can buy with no money down. So now there are solar loans where you get no money, you put no money down and what you pay for your loan each month combined with what you're paying to the utility each month must be lower than what you're currently paying to the utility with the ownership. And with ownership, you also get the federal tax deduction. And with ownership, we're also seeing that it actually increases the value of your home. So the research is now in that actually solar increases the value of your home. With leasing, um, you don't get the tax deduction because you don't own the, the, the structure and it doesn't increase the value of your home because technically you don't own, that home doesn't own it, it's actually a lien on your home. And so it actually really hurts, um, it actually hurts the people that actually could benefit the most from ownership. And actually really interesting, there's a huge now kind of crisis in South Carolina, um, in, in uh, Charleston, South Carolina specifically, with leasing, and there are so many homes now that are underwater because they had leased um, solar, and it's really frustrating. And really, what they—it uh, looks like now the utility may wind up buying those leases out, but it's a bad situation. So I'm a big fan of now ownership, owning, owning, owning. Where in Massachusetts are you from? I'm from uh, Needham. In fact, I was on the. Uh, uh, Energy Efficiency Council here. I represented a gas company. Hey, so wait, I grew up in Needham. So I went, I grew up in Needham, Massachusetts. Okay, I, I live just off Central Avenue. I grew up on Tudor Road and okay. um, my brother's in Needham still. He's a town meeting member and um, I'm a big family, 11 kids. We all grew up in Needham. How about that? Huh? That's a small world. It's a great town, isn't it? Don't you miss it? Well, um, unfortunately, this winter, I haven't been to Florida, so I haven't missed it. <laughs> I haven't missed Needle. All, right. All right, there you go. All right, good. All right, well, I miss it. I got to tell you that much. I love it. It's hometown USA. I love it. All right, so let me just, I got a couple, I think I'm almost done here on my slide, but go to, um, I would say just on all of the work here that we've done, it's all measured and verified um, and researched by NYU, Yale, and actually the US Department of Energy. So uh, check out our, our reports and I can, um, Tammy, I can send you the link too. So if you wanna send it out to folks too. Um, and then uh, I think I did that. Oh, and here's kind of just some real kind of interesting successes here. So I'll show you that this is um, it, slide one here kind of basically shows in our solarized campaigns, this is in, um, it's somewhat confusing, but if you see that orange line here, this we call this the hockey stick slide, but that orange line is in effect 
kind of the trajectory of what solar would be doing without doing any solarized campaigns. And then this, the spike is actually when solarized started. And so everywhere that solarized campaigns happen, we get that hockey stick effect. And then more interesting and not more interesting, but actually as interesting is um, when, that can, when these campaigns end, the campaigns last about 16 to 20 weeks, we then have what they call persistence that in fact, more homes continue to get solar actually at about a 20% rate for the next two years. So the campaigns have this, this sense of continuing this uh, solar, which is really fascinating to see. People continue to get solar after the campaigns end. Second piece, which is fascinating, is that um, we have really we kind of, um, one of the goals with solar has always been, or one of the thoughts have been, wealthy communities will buy solar, but uh, low to moderate income communities would not. And so we've done a lot of testing in these LMI communities. And we have shown, in fact, that the solarized campaigns are as effective in LMI communities as they are in wealthy communities. And that's a big breakthrough. Um, and then we've also shown that with working with utility companies, we can actually pinpoint specific areas within utility uh, territories on where to put solar. And that's a really important point because utilities have um, congested areas that they need to kind of work on. Um, and so they, they would say, a utility will say, well, we need to build more power plants or we need to build more capacity because of these very congested areas. And what we have shown is, well, actually, we can actually go into a community, a neighborhood, and encourage them through a solarized campaign to put solar on their homes, alleviating that congestion and then negating the need for you to build a power plant. And that actually saves money, it saves pollution and uh, saves time. So that's a big deal. And then ultimately we've really seen that these solarized campaigns uh, increase solar adoption by 1000% in these communities. And that's not us saying it, that's the researchers from Yale and, and NYU saying that, and that's uh, hugely significant. And then on the flip side for the solar installers who are by and large are mom and pop shops, uh, they are seeing a 14% conversion rate through these solarized campaigns which is a conversion rate being uh, the rate of people saying, I think I'm interested in solar and then actually buying solar. And on a kind of national level, that conversion rate is really about 5% where 6% would be a really great conversion rate. The solarized campaigns are about a 14% conversion rate and that's significant. And then ultimately there's just kind of the bottom line, which is, we are seeing the creation of really, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue from these campaigns. Um, and so you can see really in, in on 20 weeks, 18, 19 weeks, just in three campaigns, two of them in Rhode Island and one in Connecticut, uh, that we actually, you know, wind up with over $300,000 in revenues um, uh, with 122 solar contracts and ultimately 890 leads of people who think who say they want to buy solar. So that's, uh, in, you know, in the solar world and solar marketplace, all of those numbers are significant and really show real movement in the market. Um, so kind of what we're actually showing, it, it's, and this is to some, this slide, some of them is inside ball, but it does show real momentum in the marketplace and um, if you remember kind of from those television ads I showed you, we didn't have any numbers like this uh, from those television ads. So it's really showing that this peer-to-peer, friend-to-friend, neighbor-to-neighbor, building trust from friends and neighbors actually gets people to buy solar. And that's really what we're trying to do because that actually leads to sustainability. It leads to a sustainable marketplace and it helps people build the trust that they want. And that's really what we're creating. It's a, a proven model of securing solar contracts and solar loans that gets solar customers faster and easier. And that's, that's really the game here. 
In fact, in three years, we actually did $100 million of solar, of installed solar on an investment. We're a nonprofit, so just an investment of $3.5 million. Um, that's 3,500 residential homes uh, solarized, more than 20,000 residents who actually inquired about solar, 28 megawatts of installed solar. In fact, that 28 megawatts, if that were a single solar array, it would have uh, it would actually be the largest solar array in all of New England. Um, and it actually represents 25,000 metric tons of greenhouse gas uh, reduced. So it's actually really a big deal. Um, so really kind of just bring it to, to a close. Um, you know, our campaigns, again, it's a thousand percent um, increase uh, in per community. And our job really is to solarize and help people get energy smart. So at the end of the day, anything we can do to help you all get energy smart, we're here to help. And we'd love you to be part of our efforts uh, in Florida or equivalently anywhere you live. So my contact information is here and don't hesitate to call, email or, uh, or anything. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Mrs. Greenberger, of course. I don't have time this evening, I have to leave, but I would really like to understand more how it actually works for an individual homeowner to, to use it. Uh, I've, I've seen so many stories about you, you, you uh, supply your own home, you, you, you deduct it from your, your electric bill and you even can send it back to, to alleviate more. And I, I don't understand how any of that works. And, and, and I'm actually very interested in the benefits. However, I'm also in an area that does not have a lot of sun in the winter. Um, sure. So um, as I said, I, I don't have time for the nuts and bolts, but I'm really more interested in that. Can you, can I, will you email me or could I email you and kind of send you all the, can we have a conversation tomorrow or sometime next week? Because it's actually, um, it's actually easy and it's mate, it literally is maintenance free. We got solar on this house and it is, it's, um, I am shocked how maintenance free it is and how I forget that I have solar. Um, it's, it's kind of one of those things. And this concept of sending it back to the utility is part of the, um, it's, it's kind of a, it's a financing scheme so that it actually becomes more affordable. And so they call that net metering. So mm -hmm. when we're not using the solar, the utility in some states has to buy it back and so they have to buy the energy back. Um, and increasingly, it's, it's somewhat of a con contentious issue. And increasingly, um, I think we'll see that won't be, that won't be a deal. You know, they won't do it. Um, the utilities don't wanna have to buy it back. But as you know, we don't have solar battery at this house, but as soon as I get one, I'm not gonna wanna sell it back to the utility because I'm gonna wanna store it in my battery so I can have it when I need it. I'll have it at night, that type of thing. But I'd love to talk about it further because it's really. It's really so the bad. question there, uh, Brian, is is are you going to get uh, the value for transmission and distribution when you send it back to the utility? How yeah. has the utility avoided those costs? And that's the issue. Right. Well, and I think you know, my what what I've seen just with my solar and kind of the the way it works. If we go back to that concept to where I was talking about the phantom load in the house, the ho homes use so much energy and are just wasting so much energy that uh, this e to turn off a house when a home is not using energy, it's actually really hard. It's kind of like, wow, the home is always using power. So you have to really turn everything off before the utility is actually really taking power back. And so in that case, we don't even really need this net metering thing. I mean, just let's get battery storage with our solar because we are increasingly seeing, we increasingly are having storms. And, um, the, and by the way, we are increasingly having electric vehicles. So why not have a battery where you can actually then either power your home when you don't have power or power your car? And by the way, and it's one of the things people don't get, and truthfully, I didn't either, 
But with when you have net metering and the power goes out, your solar doesn't work. So you don't have power in the house because you have solar if you have a blackout, if you have net metering, because the because it automatically shuts off. But if you have a battery, then you do have power. And it's like, oh, well, I'd rather just have power than no power. So it's like, oh, and I'd rather be able to charge my car once I have an electric vehicle. So it's kind of like, oh, and you can see the trends are all going that way. So it's really, and, and, and then also the trend is this concept of net metering is such a, a hot button issue for utilities and for politicians. So it's like, let's just get rid of that hot button issue. There's no need to kind of have it. Um, and then the other piece that's so interesting is that with zero down loans for people, this cons the, the affordability of solar is really, is, is right there. It's kind of, it, you know, it's no money down. It becomes a, how much can I afford each month? And whatever I'm paying has to be less than what I'm currently paying to the utility. Then it's a win, win, win. So let's just kind of, let's just do it that way. Brian, who's, um, who's getting this loan? I know when I looked into getting maybe solar or the windows, there was a company called Y Green, but that attached the loan to the mortgage of your home and you couldn't sell it without letting people know that you had this. This is something totally different. Yeah, so there's a, there are, and that's an interesting one too. That's an interesting concept um, that's out there. There are about now six solar loan companies in the country. Um, and they operate really the same way, you know, when you get a, when you buy a car. Uh, so, and they work through the solar installer. So you talk to, so you, you know, say solar installer comes to your house and they say, yeah, I can put solar on your house. And you say, great, how am I going to pay for it? They would say, oh, I can finance it. No problem. The same way your car dealer would say, oh, I can finance your car for you. But the car dealer isn't really financing it. They're going to GMAC and the solar installer, they're not really financing it. They're gonna to go to one of these other solar companies, install loan companies. And so, um, and it's about six of them. There's Dividend Solar, there's Mosaic, Solar Mosaic, there's um, uh, Sunrun, there's, one, there's a bunch of them. Um, but basically they all operate in the same, the same piece, which is, um, it's, it's a simple, uh, more or less 15 year uh, loan. And uh, you put zero money down and by law, the, I think the coolest thing is by law, what you pay each month for your loan, plus what you then are still paying to the utility because you're still connected to the utility must be less than what you are currently paying to the utility before you got solar, which is unbelievable. So say you're paying, you know, $150 a month to the utility, then you get solar in a solar loan, it must be less than $150. Now it might be $149, but still it's like, wow, that's pretty cool. That's amazing. Like, it's pretty amazing. So right. um, and anyway, so, so I, I wound up getting a loan for my solar just to actually see if it really worked and it really works. It was really pretty cool. Brian, so. I wanted to ask you that I noticed that you cited Rhode Island, Connecticut, and you know, you focused on some of the northern yes. states where they have much less sun than Florida. Florida, I think, is the state in the United States that has the most. Yeah. If not the state, you know, after Hawaii or California. What's being done in Florida and what are you, what's your work in Florida? So tragically, we've never actually officially like done work in Florida and I'll tell you why. <laughs> so uh, uh, there are some states that are considered very solar friendly states. Um, and so you have kind of uh, by and large, the Northeastern states are very solar friendly and increasingly now you have North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, um, increasingly solar friendly. And by that, it's by and large, the utilities in those states um, to some extent dictate their 
welcoming ability of these of, of renewables. And um, and then out in the west, out west, you have similarly kind of very welcoming. And, and then we do a <laughs> lot of work in Arizona, um, mm -hmm. kind of in the mid southwest and midwest. Um, but Florida has been the toughest nut to crack for us. Why? Uh, I think the initials are FBL, uh, but it's but it, but it has been so. I don't want to say it out loud, but they have been very challenging, um, and 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 part of it is um, some utilities like to keep a very tight grip on on the on how they work with solar. So uh, it has been challenging. So there's been that. I would. Also, I mean, I, I don't see uh, uh, the savings. Uh, uh, you'd have to have the, the uh, uh, I mean, they wouldn't want to give you the uh, uh, net, it, net uh, yeah. metering on distribution and transmission uh, because they would have to charge that back to other customers and that would increase the rates to all the other customers that don't have solar. So that is that is a large part of the argument. It's interesting, they, and, uh, and in Arizona, they've made that argument too, and yet the utilities have been like, come on in and do what, you know, if people wanna buy it, they'll buy it. And, and my argument has been, um, so people will say, and Andrew, you said it too, you know, uh, energy is so cheap in, in um, Florida, why would people, you know, people don't necessarily need to buy it. But um, it's a value decision and people have different values and it's fascinating <laughs> to see how it plays out. So people will buy solar, people will buy, people will buy anything, quite frankly, based on their own different values. So you will see, um, you know, people are buying a $100,000 car, even though there's a $25,000 car that actually still gets from point A to point B. You know, it's like, but they, they just have different values. It's like, wow, that's unbelievable. So it's never always, it's never only just price. They are different values that people are making. And that's really kind of what we are. And that's really good marketing is that you're actually playing on their in an individual's different value points. The argument kind of goes like this, which is, um, when you go to buy soap, you go to the grocery store and, you know, at the, there's like a wall of soap, right? You know, it's like, and at that moment that you buy soap, you are making an instantaneous value decision. And in the United States, the number one value that people ascribe to soap, to a soap purchase, is that's the soap I always buy, even though, uh, there will always be soap that's on sale. There will be soap that's in a brick and kind of selling it like by bulk. There'll be different, there'll be high, you know, oatmeal and honey soap. They're always trying to lure you away to buy other different types of soap. But the number one value that people say is, I'm buying that soap because I always buy that soap. And so it's, they're always trying to drive these different value points. And so it's the same thing with solar, it's the same thing with cars. It's trying to hit different value points. And it's not only always just price. People will buy solar because, you know, in Arizona, they say, well, it just makes sense. We live in a desert, you know, like I'm buying solar, I live in a desert. And, and in Arizona, so many people, they actually hate their utility. So they're like, I'm gonna buy it because the utility doesn't want me to buy it. So I'm gonna buy it. And then they buy it because uh, they don't they don't necessarily believe in climate change, but they can't stand the pollution in Phoenix. And so like, I'm going to, you know, it's like, all right, that hits fine. Like, it's, it's unbelievable. But you tell them to make their own value points like solar makes sense because boom. And it's really it's the funnest part of marketing, I think, is seeing how people come to their value point. It's really interesting. Anyway. Brian, does um, do the power plants, I know, I forgot, I think there was a member I spoke to that actually is working with power plants are coming to Florida 
And are those going to be indirectly related to FPNL? Are they separate? Are they going to be a threat to FPNL? And is solar and um, nuclear power going to be now like racing to see who is going to, I guess, win the win this uh, environmental race that's going on? Well, it'll be all part of the same solution, actually. So, um, and it'll be fat, and it's, it has to be because what they're really um, looking at now is is now that we now with battery storage for solar we we can and we are building utility scale solar plants um, and that is a big game changer so you know <clears throat> really what i've been talking about is kind of what we call rooftop solar one one house one solar panel that type of thing but utilities are actually like well that's great but what we like is a giant power plant that could power, you know, a hundred thousand homes, and that's what they want to build. And increasingly, they kind of can. Um, what they need is a, what a utility really needs is, you know, power twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, three hundred sixty five days a year. And with solar, they haven't been able to get that because you can't. You had until now, you haven't been able to store it, but now you can. So. If they could, they can now they it's like, well, yeah, we'll build a big power plant. We'll store that energy so that we can collect the energy all day and then also run it all night. And that's a big game, huge game changer. The creation of nuclear power plants is a, is a lot dicier. I think we're, we, the United States has not created a new power plant since 1962, <laughs> three, I think, and we're creating one now in Georgia, but they're unbelievably expensive to create. The benefit is that they are carbon-free power. Um, and so, um, uh, but it's, you know, billion, billions and billions of dollars to create one. So um, we're creating one and building one in Georgia now. And I know Arizona has the oldest nuclear power plant in Palo Verde. Um, and they anticipate keeping that alive going and through 2050. Um, and but what you, what we're seeing, which is cool, is you know in Arizona the utility there said, uh, and when we started working in Arizona, they owned Arizona Public Service owned uh, the oldest and dirtiest coal-fired power plants in the country, and they brought us in to work on their solar programs, and um, and through the years they then actually shut down their coal-fired power plants. And, um, and then just last year said that they are going to be carbon free, not carbon neutral, but carbon free by 2050, which is really unheard of for a utility to say that. But because they said that, then their utility commission said, oh, good idea. All the utilities in Arizona will be carbon free by 2050, uh, which means they're gonna use a combination of keeping their nukes alive uh, solar plus battery um, and uh, probably wind, any type of technology possible, natural gas to actually be carbon free by 2050. And that is really a game changer. Um, but it really means, you know, people are really taking this seriously. They're actually really seeing that there is, um, that there's, they have a responsibility and that there's a real path to actually doing this you know, giving us the energy we need carbon-free, which is really unbelievable. It's really pretty I am, Yeah. Is it, is it uh, Florida Power and Light a subsidiary of Nextera Energy? I think they are, yes. And is it Nextera Energy, uh, frankly, the largest uh, investor in uh, uh, solar and wind, projects uh, of any company in the United States. I don't know that, but are you looking online and seeing that? But I don't know that. And if that's how, where are you seeing that? I don't know that. Uh, uh, Nextera and uh, I Ibendola uh, from, uh, from uh, Spain, uh, Spain, which owns uh, uh, central 
uh, power of Maine and, and uh, companies in New England, other companies uh, are the two largest uh, uh, wind uh, people yeah. uh, in the country. Uh, uh, and uh, I think that Florida Power and Light is probably doesn't want to uh, give up its monopoly position. I don't deny that. It's the monopoly position for sure. Because they do send around that uh, they'll probably uh, put uh, uh, some uh, small improvements in your condo or in your house, uh, uh, you know, to save you $138 a year or something like that. Yeah. No, I mean, so many of these utilities have, um, it, and truly all of them have come light years from where they were when, when I started Smart Power 20 years ago. And, and by the way, every corporation in the country has. I was talking to a company today and they were, and, um, you know, they wouldn't, we could not get a company, a CEO to stand with us 20 years ago to talk about this stuff. And then little by little, they were kind of like, oh, we'll give you a, quote for your press release or, and then maybe we'll stand with you to say something nice and it was all just show and tell. And now, by the way, you know, now they're talking carbon free by 2050 and, you know, the, the Fortune 5000 are saying that, you know, e, what they call ESG, environmental and social governance is actually running the boardroom. Like this is, it's not a joke. It's not window dressing. It actually really matters to their bottom line. Um, so it's we we have come light years, um, and so it's a, it is a, it's things are very different than they were when we started, and it's it's unbelievably exciting. It's very cool. Brian, I have um, one of our one of our members um, contacted their son of Virginia, and um, his response, I guess to his suggestion was it takes many years to get the return on the cost to buy and install it. And it looks hideous from the outside. And she's like, how do you respond to that? Well, beauty's on the, in the eye of the beholder. So that's for sure. Um, so, so, you know, some people love it. Some people hate it. Um, and I, I, that, that is just my answer to that. I, I would say that, um, my the solar I have on my house I actually have on the back of my house because people have I've heard that from so many people but everybody who sees it has said like why don't you show it off more it's so great why don't you show it off so I think it's kind of funny um, the payback time on solar the traditional what is kind of the, the um, uh, standard if you will is about seven years seven years it lasts between 20 and 25 years. So I actually challenge you to find anything else that is free after seven years. So now when I started Smart Power, the payback was not seven years. The payback was probably 20 years and it lasted 20 years, but seven years is pretty unbelievable. And so, so now- what happens, what happens to the roofs? I mean, if the roofs don't even last that long, what happens to the solar so, panels on the roofs? By law, you're not allowed to put solar on your roof if the roof needs to be repaired within five years. So they won't put it on unless you actually have, if you will, a new roof. Um, and then the roof actually does last 20 years. So, um, so it should age with the roof. It's not, and will the uh, solar people give me a loan to uh, get a roof as well and go and tag yeah. it with the solar? Yeah, they do. They, they can and they do. And actually, um, it's um, part of the, um, you know, the some of the solar loans that are out there have roof loans tied right into that too. And they tie it right in. And, and it's actually a great way, if you're doing a, a new roof, that's when you should actually get solar. And then actually solar protects the roof and that's in that way. 
So that's why it actually increases the value of the house in so many ways, because it actually lengthens the length of your roof. So that might be a good idea through condos associations, because I you know we're going through that. If we could find someone that could give us a new roof and solar, and we didn't have to pay for it, a yeah. condo who, and a condo association that would have their roofs coming up, it would be a win-win. It is though, yeah. No, it's amazing. So I'll be contacting you very soon. All right, cool. All right, cool beans. So what would the club say about all that? So um, the I did talk to Mike Eustace, by the way, before this, okay, because oh. I figured we would have some dialogue real quick. And um, he, of course, said that the homes, you know, it's a lot easier for the homes to go oh, solar. Yeah. Okay, yeah. now they're, you know, certain things. And as for the condos, it really does depend on the um, on the condo association. Mike Eustace does not have anything to do with that. Right. But again, it would be going through your having your meetings with your con like you are on your condo association is to get Brian to come on and talk to them and go through that process. Again, it is not Glen Eagles, but it's something that's going to start with your condo. And Mike did not say that that it's it's an automatic automatically it's a no but there are some hoops there are some things to do but they are certainly not going to discount it but it does all start with your homeowners association let's thanks that. let's do that another job <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah uh yeah mike is so aware of everything i mean i know a lot of people talked about the um the the chargers for your cars and everything and having that at the club. And, you know, Mike used just did follow through with it and, you know, and it, it, it does cost right now. There's only what five community, five people, I think that have electric cars and to put one of those chargers in, even if Tesla donates the charging station, it could still talk, it could still take 10,000 so dollars to set one up. And Brian said, call Florida power and light and see if they can't help us out with that. So that's what you know. You, we can talk to Brian about is just to pick his brains about how to go about getting some of these things, just like condo associations, you know, if people come in with an electronic, you know, an, an EV car and, um, and putting those chargers in, it would be just, just on a larger scale with solar, but definitely, I mean, it's something, Mrs. Cavanaugh, that is war is warranted. I don't, and I think a lot of people, again, I think you just need to start that buzz. You know, I we already have. Happened. We already have an electric charger in Clooney, uh, yeah, and all the condo associations did go together and write up the standards for it oh, and for yeah. its installation. I mean, yeah, I think that gentleman, so I think the gentleman in Clooney, I think he moved and the owner took away the charging station. No. <laughs> yeah. We worked so hard on that. I know, but that's what happened. That's what I was told. It is so, but again, I think more and more people are going to start buying these electronic vehicle, elect, electric yeah. vehicles. And that's what Brian, I'm hoping to come back or I have another person to come back and talk about the future of electric cars. And then that would be something again that you know you know we can talk about looking ahead of what people are going to drive and powering the cars and like he said you know the batteries and the solar it can just it can go and go and go and um, again it's not all about saving our money you know you've been it, you've been to all our lectures it's all about our future it's all about our kids fifty right. years you know so that's something that we can work on now the future and that's really been the heart of all of these talks. And so I think Mrs. Cavanaugh, not that I can do anything, but I can introduce you to Brian and it doesn't take long to do a Zoom call with your HOA. Let's do it, that'd be great. No, that'd be great. I love that. Thank you. Thank I'll you give you an extra copy of his book. I'll give, you, I'll give you an extra copy of the book to give to your uh, Exactly. exactly. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you guys so All right. much. All right, guys. So I will get back to you when I talk to Brian about him coming back uh, for a couple of times. I hope you enjoyed this. So 
We did record this. Actually, I'm going to stop the recording now. Great.